So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are joining us today um, and to listen to our conversation. Uh, my name is Mina Hasman. I'm an architect and sustainability lead at Skidmore Owens & Merrill, which is an interdisciplinary design firm spanning across 10 different offices around the world. Uh, today, um, we are specifically talking about the skills for green construction recovery and highlighting the need to address the critical lack of capacity that exists within the built environment sector all around the world, but specifically shining a light to the Commonwealth region, which hosts the countries that are rapidly organizing and among the most vulnerable to impacts of climate change. Ahead of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which will take place next year, we're here convened by some of the key stakeholders today. Thank you, Victoria, for being here in person and others virtually joining us to discuss this important topic at this urgent time. Uh, and in today's session, we will inevitably be touching upon the need for uh, cross-sectoral collaboration and also collaboration between industry and academia to help accelerate the decarbonization of our sector. So I would like to also take this opportunity to briefly introduce all of our panelists today. I will start with Victoria, who's sitting next to me. Victoria is the Director of Advancing Net Zero at World Green Building Council, um, which is a global project that has been established to ensure that all buildings are net zero carbon by 2050, the latest. And in her role at World Green Building Council, uh, Victoria supports all Green Building Councils around the world to create tools and standards relevant for their markets so that they can accelerate the decarbonization of the sector. Thank you, Victoria, for being here. Yeah. Uh, we're also virtually joined by uh, three other panelists, actually four other panelists, um, Kaleem Siddiqui, who is joining us from Pakistan. Thank you, Kaleem, for making the time today. Kaleem is the president of the Commonwealth Association of Architects, and with 40 years of uh, industry practice, as well as also in the recent years, his exploration of the skills and capacity, specifically within the Commonwealth region, uh, Kaleem will be able to provide insights from the Commonwealth in the status of their built environment profession today. And we're also joined by Simon Sadinsky, who is an executive director at the Princess Foundation, uh, which champions sustainability approach for uh, building better lives and also resilient communities for the future. Simon is also uh, serving on the governing board of the Global Center on Healthcare and Urbanization at Kellogg College at the University of Oxford, and he sits on all party parliamentary group on craft. Thank you, Simon, for joining us today. And taking advantage of this virtual connectivity um, that we have been provided with, uh, we're also joined by two esteemed guests who are representatives of the Association of the Commonwealth Universities. We have Fatma Abdelal, who is joining us from New Zealand, uh, from far afield. Um, Fatma, we're thrilled to have you on the board as the voice of the next generation of built environment professionals. Um, as an architecture engineer and researcher, uh, Fatma is currently doing her PhD, which specifically focuses on improving carbon budget uh, by improving and optimizing built environment assets. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Mahendra Gorchuran, who is joining us from Mauritius, where he's a senior lecturer at the University of Mauritius. As a chartered engineer, um, Mahendra, also known as Kishan, is a part of the Commonwealth Futures Climate Research Cohort and an Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy Pioneer of Mauritius. Thank you very much, Mahendra, for making the time today. So I would like to welcome also for those who are listening to us today, both physically here and also virtually. Um, we're very thankful for this conversation taking place at this moment in time. Now I actually would like to give the stage to Kaleem, uh, as I mentioned before, with his insights from the Commonwealth Association of Architects, Planners, as well as in general within the Commonwealth world. Uh, Kaleem, would you please be able to give us the, the status of the built environment professions within the Commonwealth region specifically highlighting the need for the greater capacity building and skills gap that exists in the region. Thank you, Mina. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from the uh, Commonwealth from Association the... of Architects and a very warm welcome very to you all. Warm. At the Commonwealth Association of Architects, the subject of the built environment has been a top priority. The challenges of climate change, rapid urbanization, compounded with social inequalities, and most recently the COVID-19 pandemic, forces us to take a serious look at whether the built environment sector has the capacity to effectively act at a fast track to achieve 
sustainable urbanization in the Commonwealth. With this objective in view, we at the CAA, along with colleagues from Commonwealth Association of Planners, Surveyors, Land Economists, and the Engineers Council, undertook a series of surveys related to the built environment profession. The first survey, which was carried out in 2017 uh, by CAA, as well as by the Commonwealth Association of Planners, revealed a critical lack of capacity together with weakness in built environment policy in many of the Commonwealth countries and are urbanizing most rapidly among the most vulnerable. Consequently, the second survey carried out in 2019 and joined by other related organizations confirmed that the challenges identified in the surveys undertaken in 2017 were even more serious and than the first imagined, affect more countries and are being experienced across all the four disciplines. Another survey of the profession was also undertaken on similar lines in Pakistan by the Council of Architects and Town Planners here way back in 2019 as well, with results similar to what we got from the earlier surveys conducted by us. An analysis of the projections produced by UN Habitats reveals that nearly 50% of the projected 2.5 billion increase in the world's population projected to 2050 will be in the Commonwealth. The survey carried out of the built environment professions in the Commonwealth is significant as many Commonwealth countries are already experiencing the impact of climate change and rapid urbanization and 2020 marked the start of the decade of action to achieve UN 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Growth rate of population and rapid urbanization is a key Commonwealth issue. Over 90% of the forecast of the 2.5 billion growth in the world's urban population will be in Asia and Africa. 50% of this growth will be in the Commonwealth that is adding an additional 1 billion urban dwellers, resulting in a growing share of urban developers. In 2020, 24% of urban world urban population came from Commonwealth. By 2050, this share will increase to 31%, as a result of which significant new construction is expected. The amount of additional floor space expected over the next 60 years is greater than that we currently exists, with nearly 90 billion square meters of additional floor space predicted in Africa alone. Over 95% of the 234 cities most affected by climate change and considered extreme risk are in Africa and in Asia. Now the question here is, are we equipped enough with the skills to take on the challenges of the rapid urbanization and sustainability of the built environment? The survey conducted highlights that there is a continuing critical lack of capacity in many of the Commonwealth countries which are rapidly urbanizing and are among the most vulnerable. It is seen from the results of this survey that there is an acute imbalance between the number of built environment profession, professionals in each country when compared with the rate of urban growth, which you can see from the, from the figures here being projected. The second most critical thing is the lack of educational and institutional capacity to grow the profession fast enough in many of the countries. While lack of capacity among built environment professionals is a serious issue in a number of countries, the rate at which the profession is growing in these countries is also insufficient. The findings of the 2019 survey reveals that lack of educational capacity remains a concern and that is affecting each of the principal built environment professions to a greater or lesser extent. 
some of the key challenges facing the education or built environment profession includes poorly skilled and uneducated teaching staff together with outdated curriculum. It's not simply the number of graduates, it's also the quality of the education. Indeed, the need for curriculum review for a, to better reflect the challenges of climate change is a necessity. Number three aspect of our critical aspect is the increasing recognition of weakness in built environment policy in many of the Commonwealth countries in terms of standards, implementation, and enforcement. The results of the survey show that there is considerable scope for strengthening built environment policy in a number of Commonwealth countries. Either the planning policies and building codes are not fit for the purpose or they are not implemented effectively. Most of the countries anticipating the highest rates of urbanization have no mandatory energy codes or codes that are not mandatory at all. So hence, there is an urgent need for us to tackle the critical lack of capacity among built environment profession as elaborated and explained earlier. The impact of unplanned and poorly planned settlements can already be seen in terms of widespread inequalities, informality, and vulnerability. The Commonwealth Association of Architects is committed to working with partners to develop the call to action into a program of practical action that will have real impact on the ground. And lastly, an appeal to all heads of Commonwealth governments to put greater focus on the sustainable urbanization issues which have been neglected in their policy formulations for an, of our future to come. Uh, with this, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kaleem. This is startling data that you're sharing with us and it is really highlighting the need and urgency of a collective action that needs to be taken to help build greater capacity within the Commonwealth region. I also um, briefly wanted to introduce one of the main actions that the global built environment sector and academia is taking to help bridge this gap, this knowledge and capacity gap. So it's a climate framework initiative that I would like to briefly introduce you um, and then followed on, we'll have a conversation with our panelists to hear their perspectives on, the, on this particular issue that we're highlighting today. Uh, many challenges we've been facing around the world have really been demanding a realignment of our focus and priorities as built environment professionals, um, but also a re-evaluation of our skills and knowledge that Kaleem had also touched upon, um, which are the underlying factors of competence. Competence very much needed to deliver on the challenges of today, but also in the future. And at the heart of this challenge really lies the perplexed dichotomy of time and scale. Time in terms of the rather limited time frame we have been given by climate change experts, and also the scale of the positive impact that we need to deliver uh, to help accelerate the decarbonization of our sector. And the evidence is clear, as Kaleem mentioned, and uh, there are many researchers out there that highlight the critical lack of capacity around the world, but specifically within the Commonwealth region. So in this time where we need multifaceted and quite holistic responses that are delivered fast and in scale, it is essential that knowledge is actually uniform and continuous. And that knowledge is built on a common set of fundamentals that are weaved through from academia to industry so that there is consistency in the way that knowledge is shared, disseminated and built upon for collective climate action. And um, it's inevitable to mention that consistency is of essence here. And, and also collaboration is a must, because not only a single organization of any kind will be able to deliver on the ambitions that we're all embarking upon to address climate change. And so this is the premise and the mission of the Climate Framework Initiative, which is cross-pollinating experience and expertise across the global built environment sector and academia by acknowledging different professions and disciplines and by uniting building industry and academia together under the same umbrella. 
currently developed over the last year with 530 individuals in collaboration around the global work of, of the sector and academia. This transdisciplinary initiative is supported by 90 plus organizations and currently growing. In this initiative, we've been able to bring multi-generations together uh, along different parts of the value chain of the sector to help build consistently and collectively the capacity that is required, especially within the Commonwealth region. And what we're doing is actually we're trying to leverage the industry's existing experience and knowledge uh, by drawing on the invaluable resources that already exist out there and through effective and collective upskilling, we can help decarbonize the sector's decarbonization all around the world. And we're building a true community of individuals, some of which are represented here with the diversity of organizations that they are sitting at. And we're building a common ground and defining a common language for climate action. And I mentioned the fundamentals of knowledge and how knowledge needs to be uniform. In this initiative, we're also creating a shared curriculum framework to define the holistic knowledge base that every built environment actor who influences the built environment sector must equip themselves with in order to deliver truly net zero carbon and sustainable buildings today and also in the future. Direct link and collaboration with academia is a fundamental part of the success story here. And therefore, in this initiative, we're aligning expectations uh, between academia and industry and try to weave a, a knowledge thread that comes from academia to industry in order to ensure that there's consistency and continuity in the, in the way that knowledge is built, disseminated and built upon throughout different stages of a built environment professional's life. This is really essential because it's the only way we can accelerate the decarbonization of our sector by bringing the know-hows of the industry into the core education of the next generation of built environment professionals, but also close the feedback loops by bringing the best academic research from academia uh, to help inform progress and also deliver innovation that the sector continues to need. It's very much underpinned by the United Nations system of the open goals, specifically looking at the goals that are directly impacted by the work we deliver within the built environment sector. Uh, the framework contextualizes the knowledge and skills that are required from the built environment sector. And it's structured around six overarching topics uh, supported by um, additional global and built environment context, as well as common threads. So these topics of retrofit, climate justice, or ethical procurement or disaster risk resilience that are so critical that they need to be addressed out of all these um, outcomes and topics presented here. And uh, our vision is that the climate framework becomes adopted by all at the end of 2022 so that we can consistently and collectively build this great uh, capacity, address the great capacity cap that currently exists all around the world, but specifically within the Commonwealth region. And there is already a great example of how this is happening here in the UK, where the Royal Institute of British Architects have adopted the climate framework um, as a curriculum structure to define their climate literacy knowledge schedule, which they're demanding all of their current and, and future members uh, to become a climate literate around these subject matters listed here. And following on from this, the Construction Industry Council has recently launched a climate action plan where they are setting this as an expectation to adopt the cross-industry climate framework curriculum to build consistently the training programs uh, for different disciplines and professions. Mm -hmm. And our hope that is what the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals has achieved in uni uniting and unifying the whole world around a set of common topics and goals. We're hoping that the climate framework can become the universally adopted framework for knowledge and capacity building and skills developing for the built environment sector. Um, so now I actually, having uh, spoken about the context of the Commonwealth uh, and the critical lack of capacity that Kaleen had highlighted and a key action that the global built environment sector and academia is taking to address this urgent need, I would like to actually uh, turn to our panelists and, and hear their observations and views about this critical subject matter, perhaps sharing some of the experiences that you may have within your own regions. And if I may start with uh, Fatma, um, it would be wonderful to hear about your perspective on the subject matter and how you think we can collectively help address the need for urgent capacity building. Um, thank you, Mina. Uh, and I'm, I'm honored and glad to be here today. Um, in line with um, 
significant role of the stakeholders' knowledge in promoting sustainability in the built environment. I would like to highlight the relationship between the knowledge, attitude, and practice of the stakeholders uh, by sharing the key outcomes of a survey study that I have conducted recently in New Zealand. Um, on various stakeholders uh, in the construction industry, such as architects, uh, engineers, sustainability consultants, contractors, developers, and suppliers. Um, the first key outcome that I would like to highlight is that um, in New Zealand, there is an attitude practice gap, uh, which can be identified as the gap between the stakeholders' intentions and the actual practices in the industry. Um, the, the stakeholders actually have a positive attitude towards sustainability and green buildings, but that attitude doesn't usually align with the industry practices. In other words, we can say that the construction industry doesn't really walk the talk. Um, second, there is a positive and significant correlation between the knowledge level and practices. Um, this is why the lack of best practices is always associated with the lack of knowledge and it can it can also explain why it's still perceived as being difficult to implement sustainability in the built environment. Um, when it comes to higher education and academic institutions, um, the research results um, brought to light that only a few number of the stakeholders in the construction industry claim to, ha to have their not gain their knowledge of sustainable buildings from university education. And they still see low value of academic research and promoting sustainability in the built environment. Um, there's also different levels of knowledge between stakeholders, for example, in New Zealand, um, the knowledge level between engineers and con Con contract contractors uh, varies a lot. Uh, so um, when we um, when we design um, sustainability or climate change curriculum uh, for universities, we should consider this knowledge gap. Um, yeah, and I would like to say that since the global community um, is calling for science-based solutions to mitigate climate change, especially after failing to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, since Paris, Paris Agreement in 2015, um, universities can really achieve that and academic institutions can play a key role to enhance the stakeholders' knowledge and bridge the gap between knowledge, attitude, and practice in the construction industry. Um, and finally, as an example of the multidisciplinary research collaboration. I would like to mention the Commonwealth Climate Research Cohort. Um, the research cohort was established by the Association of the Commonwealth Universities um, early this year, and it consists of researchers from across the Commonwealth countries, including um, Mahendra and myself, in order to work work closely with professionals and policymakers to bring local knowledge to the global stage and um, transfer this knowledge into action um, and contribute to mitigate climate change and environmental policies in our community. So. Thank you very much, Fatma. It's really important, the, the topic that you touched upon about how there are varying degrees and levels of knowledge across, that exist across the sector, but also in the higher education is a really important aspect to address when we talk about the vast uh, level of topics and knowledge that needs to be delivered when we talk about addressing climate change. I would like to go on to Simon to hear his perspective from the Princess Foundation perhaps. And I know there is a lot of work that is being done in collaboration with the Commonwealth Association of Architects and others to help uh, build a collective capacity and uh, help address this call to action that the Commonwealth had called uh, earlier this year. Would you like to elaborate on the progress that you've been making and also your observations around the subject matters? Okay. Thank you, Mina. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, there's a few themes I wanted to touch on briefly today, many of which have been uh, mentioned to some degree already, but I think are all very related. And I think the first and most fundamental uh, is really sort of revisiting this idea of the importance of developing a more holistic and interdisciplinary approach to education in this area. And I think. Um, we have a tendency in many of our education systems to teach in what sort of amount to curriculum vacuums. I think that's the case in 
primary school as well as in vocational education, undergrad, postgraduate, across those. And I think what that inevitably leads to is us practicing in professional silos. And I'm sure a lot of us have, have experienced that. And I think there's also at times a sense of competition or territoriality between professions, which I think is bred from this system, which goes back to the systems in which we learn within and we start our practices within. And I think this is a, a really primary obstacle to creating a more sustainable future in this area. That we, we have to create environments that promote knowledge exchange, that promote the idea of shared learning. Um, and that's how we learn to engage with other disciplines. It's how we provide a space for experimentation. And it's how, it's, it's how we are allowed to sort of pass on our skills and our traditions. Um, so that's not to say that there isn't a benefit in specialists, um, but rather that the journey towards specialization needs to be a more holistic one. Um, and I think I'd probably also add, that I think there's a huge amount of value in what I guess I would call sort of expert generalists. Um, and I think this is particularly important in places lacking in capacity, as was highlighted earlier. Um, and I think that's why in a lot of our work, be it in education or in practice, we really promote this benefit of a range of specialists openly sharing knowledge and seeing direct benefit for, of the collaborative approach to shared solutions. And I think that obviously relates very much to this initiative. Um, the second point I wanted to raise, and again, this sounds fairly obvious, um, but is the importance of learning by doing, of hands-on education. And I think we really do need to take our education outside of the classroom and have it be directly linked to practice. And that, that seems fairly self-evident, but it's kind of amazing in, in my experience, at least, how, how rarely there are these opportunities for meaningful and in-depth experiential learning. Um, and I think, you know, it sounds a bit like a cliche, but at the Princess Foundation, we talk about this sort of virtuous circle of learn, practice, teach. And, you know, it's this idea that we have to create a system where we can learn from best practice as well as poor practice, um, work to implement that learning into action, and then use those links with practice to teach the next generation of practitioners, who then hopefully, in turn, we can learn from down the line. And I think having implementing that sort of circle of learning and practice is a really important and fundamental thing as we move forward. Um, and then my final sort of related point is that as we look at how we find and develop new entrants into sectors as diverse as engineering, craft, agriculture, construction, architecture, and a range of others, and it is vitally important we do integrate those areas of learning, that we also need to raise both awareness of these opportunities from an early age, this starts young, so to speak, um, but also that we must create multiple pathways towards employment in this sector and towards learning in this sector. Uh, and I think in a similar vein, we shouldn't overlook in our conversations the role of vocational education in this conversation. Um, and so by taking this sort of holistic view at how all these sectors are linked together in our journey towards sustainability, um, we can create learning journeys that provide the range of skills needed for this green construction recovery. Thank you very much, Simon. It's actually a great some of the points you've raised especially around collaboration and i know Fatma and many others have touched upon this already as well uh, and i actually want to turn to victoria on this one because the premise of the green building councils all around the world but especially the world green building council is really to unite um, all the councils and all the experts as well as generalists around the world to um, collectively share knowledge uh, how from your perspective um how does the world green building council address plan to address and continues to address this issue yeah so sure, thank you so much, Mina, uh, for asking that question. I mean, I think that's exactly why Advancing Net Zero has, uh, well, Green Building Council has Advancing Net Zero because the Green Building Councils around the world working at a national level can only really go as far as their members are guiding them, right? And so the idea is that we bring the Green Building Councils together around a common goal, something that they're all working towards. They learn from each other and they, it supports them to go further, faster, um, and then World Green Building Council brings out guidance based on what some of the leading organizations and, and Green Building Councils are already advancing. Um, because you mentioned the vision earlier, right? The, the all buildings in the world, new and existing, to be completely decarbonized by 2050. And it's actually becoming less of a vision, rapidly becoming more of an imperative, right? We're hearing about this all over the world. We simply cannot build buildings the way we have in the past. 
and we cannot leave existing buildings without improving them and um, retrofitting. We've already heard about the, the massive amounts of growth that we're expecting and particularly within um, the Global South and within the Commonwealth. And so there's an immediate urgency, right? Buildings are being designed now and we're locking in those designs and those solutions that are going to impact the performance of those buildings in a long for a long time and so the green building councils are working on the, the tools the frameworks the, the knowledge hubs to be able to facilitate that share that, that learning and, and kind of share outcomes of the best practice projects i mean a lot of the the approaches and the knowledge and the, the best practice that are taken from projects can be applied to different parts of the world right the solutions might be different but the approaches that are being taken uh, take the concepts of, of energy and carbon budgets right uh, projects being evaluated and designed against not just a financial target but a, an energy or carbon budget based on how much energy renewable energy that project could create on site and therefore that provides an energy budget or a cap that has to then be designed towards like that as a concept can be applied all over the world and so we can we can help to bring all of that together because ultimately the the commonwealth everyone around the world is a zero carbon healthy accessible and resilient spaces to live in. So the green building movement has a lot of work to do. We've, uh, the, the, the green building councils and the rating tools have, have previously been driven to demonstrate how buildings can be a bit better than regulation in terms of their performance and their reducing their impact on the environment. And we have to ratchet that up in terms of ambition to, to go way beyond that and go uh, towards zero carbon. So that's what the green building councils are working on. We've had a huge amount of enthusiasm um, across the uh, Green Building Council throughout the, the Commonwealth, a, a lot of enthusiasm for net zero. And so we're building on that momentum and kind of helping to work with them and, and collaborate with them too. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Victoria. And I, I actually want to elaborate more on what you talked about later on in the in our Q&A session, but it's really important to highlight the need of, um, of different regions and parts locally needing to work together so that they can collectively scale the impact globally. Um, I would like to also give room to Mahendra to share his views as well on the subject matter. Mahendra, you're currently a senior lecturer at the University of Mauritius, and I know you have been also quite heavily involved with the Commonwealth in general um, of, uh, of Association of Architects and others. So I, I wonder how do you scale your impact and, and perhaps how, how would you believe that capacity gap and knowledge gap that can uh, that exist can or must be actually urgently addressed. Uh, thank you, Mina, and thank you very much for uh, getting the opportunity to be part of this fantastic discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. I, it's just there is a lot of echo coming yeah. in the background, but it may be also yeah. our room here as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, I will talk about my involvement in uh, levels actually in the built environment. One is actually commercial buildings, so I think that's what we're talking more here about where architects will be involved and uh, maybe uh, big companies who will be designing these commercial projects. So like Simon mentioned, I think uh, we do lack a lot in terms of integrated design, what we call integrative design, where we are involving all the professionals uh, together right at the outset of the project. I think this is going to be a major barrier to, uh, to actually design of green buildings because Currently, uh, in the context of Mauritius, uh, the project team tends to work in a very siloed manner, so they each one works in their individual disciplines. It's quite difficult to, uh, to get them to work together at the outset so that we get actually optimum designs. Uh, if you look at the history of green buildings, this has been actually a big uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, hurdle for many, many nations, I would say, even the United States, even in, in the United Kingdom. When we came up with the concept of green building, this was a hurdle that had to be overcome. I think in uh, in Mauritius or in African countries, it is now we are at that stage where we need to educate architects and big firms that they would need to work together at the start uh, to, to involve the engineers, to work with architects, even the landscape architect, all the members, the QS and the contractors are not able to get appropriate design. So I think this mindset change would need to occur if we really want to get our projects well, uh, well conceived at the start. And in terms of education, I think, uh, uh, like Simon again mentioned, it's going to be very important that when we are educating our professionals, be engineers, be uh, architects, at, at the formation level itself, they have to be trained how to work together. 
Uh, unfortunately, I think the major barrier would be these uh, architects, uh, when they are graduated, they would tend to join firms that are existing and we have this old school of thought. So if they would have to be the change makers, that would be a barrier for them. And at another level, I think uh, the education you're talking about would need to also permeate the residential sector where not necessarily architects are involved. This is one of the projects I've actually worked as part of a research project at the ACU Commonwealth Future that Fatma mentioned. So I've uh, sort of uh, proposed the concept of circular home where uh, I've actually run a few workshops for the general public on taxi design and very simple things about water runoff from your home. And it has been quite inspiring and revealing for people where you talk very simple things to them around the solar path and how it is affecting their home. And for them to understand now uh, how, for example, they are installing more air conditioning, but very simple solutions to be taken in terms of external shading and so on. So I think at that level as well, we have to make effort because uh, when we talk about architecture education, we are tackling maybe big projects, but architects are not normally involved on smaller residential projects. And how do we actually consider or uh, rope in this uh, type of construction as well, it's very important as well. So I think uh, we need to have, and this is where academics can play a big role, where they can go and, and uh, work with the community and raise awareness, very simple passive design measures, which can be applied for, uh, for I would say, uh, residential small homes, which also have huge impacts. For example, in Mauritius County, we have a problem with flooding, and most of this is because of people not dealing properly with one of from the roofs. But in the workshop I've been running, when you explain uh, to this to this person that actually by constructing a house, you're creating runoff, which they do not do actually. They just uh, build a house and then they think it's normal for them just to uh, send their water in road drains and it's not sustainable. And this is what's causing flooding. It has been quite inspiring and I'm revealing to them. And I think it's quite impactful as well. So very simple training could, should also be dispensed for community because I think we need to take everyone on board, the big projects, the commercial projects, as well as the residential sector. Thank you very much, Mahindra. Hopefully there was a good audio. We had difficulties hearing it from here today, but um, at least I can summarize what I heard is that you talked about the importance of addressing scale and the knowledge that needs to be delivered and skills as well that need to be delivered depending on the scale and the sort of the part of the sector that one is working. You've given the examples of the uh, smaller residential projects versus large scale commercial buildings that require curated and catered um, attention and skill set to be able to deliver on the same challenges, perhaps, but in different manners. Um, I would like to actually also uh, perhaps go back to Kaleem and, and ask the question about, Kaleem, you presented a, a very clear evidence of how there is a significant uh, critical lack of capacity within the Commonwealth region, which is rapidly urbanizing and among the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. I wonder how would you think that we can close this capacity and skills gap while on the ground? So how can we do that fast and at scale, but while also on the ground, try to accelerate the decarbonization of the sector? How can we move both things in parallel so that up, we can upskill collectively fast and at scale, while also, also delivering buildings, and Victoria touched upon this as well, already delivering buildings that are needing to meet the requirements that we would expect them to meet by 2030, 2040, and 2050. Thank you, Mina. Okay. As I told you in my presentation <clears throat> and the results of the survey, the most critical thing is that in order to have green construction or uh, climate uh, sustainability thing in your construction, you need to have certain codes and legis you know, laws. And most of the countries, I can talk about Pakistan, that uh, so far we don't even have a building code uh, for this purpose. Similarly, we lack in uh, the curriculum where the, the, the universities, where the courses are, they, they do not give importance to this uh, great aspect where the architects and planners are supposed to look at this while designing and doing the construction as far as the construction industry is concerned. Again, since there is no uh, code there or any uh, agency which actually comes and looks at it, whether it's been done accordingly or not. So to start from is first is the basic legislation. And that's why at the end of my uh, talk, I said that we need to have the government involved. Unless you have the government involved, nothing can move. And again, giving an example of what is happening, most of the uh, buildings or construction or 
uh, developers are basically are, are, are again, uh, I would say uh, they are much influential and in actually not seeing any legislation get through so that they have a free hand. Uh, that is the biggest problem which is happening in the uh, developing countries of the Commonwealth. So we have to have, as, as I said, that we need to have a three-pronged uh, you know, attack or solution because the first thing is the government and government has to realize that this cannot be just left where it is. This is a big population that we have. And uh, the rate of urbanization in Pakistan is about 2.7%. And uh, that is something that needs to be reined in, controlled as well as I was advocating at one point that we should just freeze the expansion of the city limits. We have big, huge cities with big population. Uh, which again is something which is very, very political in the sense that uh, a lot of um, big, uh, you know, developers are, are there to gain from there. So it's, we can go on discussing it, but the real problem on the ground, as I see it, are these. We need to have very, very strong uh, laws, how to use the, and how to expand our cities, new cities are required, how do we design them which are sustainable, we need to have codes in place, uh, we need to have these green building codes, uh, which we have a Pakistan green building, uh, uh, you know, authority, author, not I would say authority, green, green building uh, association, but, uh, and it has, has given uh, certain recommendations to the government almost like 10 years ago, but it is still not being made uh, a law which can allow things to be taken care of in that sense. So that's, uh, that's a big gap, although, um, you know, promises can be made and, and, but, you know, we've already lost so much time. Nothing on ground actually moved. So the, the, the main thing is how to design a system where we actually move things in a more serious manner. And that is something the government has to take the ownership and responsibility to actually deliver. It has to move. I'm talking only about the, the greater part of the uh, Commonwealth, the developing countries, which is Asia and Africa and the rest of the uh, other smaller islands and so on. Because uh, th I, I, this is what I think is most important at the moment. Thank you, Karim. I actually would like to build upon what you've touched upon. You mentioned the, the key barrier being within the Commonwealth region, especially in Pakistan, you gave the example of being the lack of code and lack of legislation that is moving the entire industry in a mainstream manner towards the same uh, end goal and meeting the minimum standards. So I actually would like to perhaps ask this question both to Victoria and Simon. What, what is the role of the organizations such as the ones you're representing today of World Green Building Council and the Princess Foundation and how informing and perhaps loving the government to uh, embed certain levels of minimum standards within the building industry. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I, I think you know absolutely right to what Colleen was saying. The lack of energy codes is a huge issue, right? Um, the, the global status report from the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, which came out, I think, was last week um, or week before, uh, is uh, showing some promising signs. I think energy efficiency was, was the second highest measure mentioned in the NDC, which is, which is really promising, right? We're starting to see this acknowledgement and recognition from governments um, that there is a need to address emissions from buildings, that one way to do that is code. Unfortunately, we can't wait for those codes, right? Um, it will take a while for governments to implement these codes, and when they are implemented, are they sufficient enough to the ambition that we know with that are needed? They're, they're having energy codes, right? And then there's having energy codes that are the right driving the right level of ambition. So there's a role there uh, for the practitioners within the built environment sector that make up the, the memberships of the, of the Green Building Councils to prove what's possible, to demonstrate that feasibility within the sector. There simply won't be regulation if we're giving the message that it's not possible or it's too expensive. It just, we simply have to prove it through the work. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing signatories of the, the net zero carbon building commitment like Skidmore, Owings and Merrill who are taking it upon themselves to say, you know, we're going to do this for our clients. We're going to show our client, we're going to take that brief 
and we're going to show the clients how we can make this the most um, you know, efficient and high performance version of this brief possible and show them how they could transform what they might not have already asked for into a build the building that they should be asking for. And that is the role of the architects, the engineers, all the disciplines across this sector to show in each market that it's possible because only then will regulation come. We, we simply can't wait for it. So that's really the, the mission of the Green Building Councils on the ground is to um, create those projects and demonstrate that confidence to the uh, to the policymakers, we call that the ambition loop, right? So as some projects are happening, that creates that confidence within policymakers. They start to think about frameworks and set long-term goals. That creates more confidence in investors to set um, uh, ambition strategies and make those investments in line with net zero economies. And then ultimately, the regulation will come. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a, a quick fix, unfortunately, but it's incremental. And as we say, we're running out of time, so we have to get ahead of that curve. And, and demonstrate what's needed before it's possible. Thank you, Victoria. That's I, actually, I love the ambition loop that you mentioned because it, it talks about also how not everything is in a circular manner, but also everything moves parallel. So together, so we don't wait for one thing to, complete, to be complete before we can move on to the next one. I actually wanted to turn to Simon. Simon, would you like to share your perspectives in general? How would, what is the role of the Princess Foundation, I guess, in this in this uh, agenda and how would you think that with your with the work that you're doing at the Princess Foundation, you can help accelerate the transition both to a decarbonized world uh, or a sector, but also in terms of closing the capacity and skills gap? Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think I would echo actually what was just said in a lot of ways. I think that one of the things that is is really important is this idea of creating, of, of seeing is believing, of creating these exemplars across different areas and understanding how things work in practice. I think it, it's one thing to promote things in, in theory and to provide to a degree an evidence space. But actually, I think one of the things that we've seen and learned is that one of the huge benefits you have is actually being able to demonstrate in practice through a live sort of exemplar project or something along those lines, the impact that can have, the methodologies, the, the positive, and negative learning journeys that you take take throughout that. So I think actually identifying and helping develop these sort of seeing is believing concepts is, is really important. But I think um, to take the answer in a slightly different direction, looking at the idea of how do we close this, this knowledge gap, I think, um, and how we do it in a relatively fast paced manner. I think one of the things that we would also say is that it's important that we sort of learn from the past and avoid the temptation to focus solely on the sort of new and, and, and exciting. And I think that there's certainly a, a place for that, but I think there are also this huge array of traditional skills, approaches and knowledge that can teach us a lot about sustainable construction and sustainable design. And I think as we search for green solutions to this problem, we should be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater to use a horrible phrase. I think um, it's this idea that you know, we shouldn't ignore what the past has to teach, what local building vernaculars, what approaches, local building approaches and materials have to teach us. Um, and I think that tradition as represented in local vernaculars is sort of the, the, the accumulation and the, the adaptation, I guess, of, of knowledge and learning over generations. Um, and I think we lose that knowledge at our peril. And I think, so I guess in, in other words, what we should try to do it, what we should try not to do is in our haste to address this issue, seek to sort of universalize the answer. Um, and so I think, I think that would be, and I think that again, reverts back to this idea of awareness raising and the role of promoting and identifying best practice and exemplars. Um, and so, yeah, sorry, a bit of a, a long way to answer to that question, but that, is, uh, that would be, I suppose, where we would see ourselves fitting in. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I actually wanted to turn to both Fatma and Mahendra to perhaps hear your perspectives from, from the academic world as you are both currently in universities and uh, both studying as well as also um, teaching. I wonder what are the key challenges that you're facing within your respective universities or in general within the academia world that is preventing the acceleration of the closing of the capacity gap uh, around topics of climate change? Um, okay, for me, I would like to say, um, as researchers or in academia, we should um, ensure the applicability of our research to the local context, uh, because there is like many um, sustainability research, but it's not really applicable to our countries. Uh, so um, we should like talk with the industry and um, in order to identify their challenges and needs. 
and um, therefore we can um, <laughs> design our research outcomes to um, overcome and solve these challenges. Uh, so we need to like build effective um, engagement strategies between uh, universities and um, the construction industry. Thank yeah, you, Fatma. Research is really a, a fundamental part of, of how the sector is going to progress through innovation, and that, that requires research to help deliver that innovation that the sector will continuously need. And so I'm thankful that you're mentioning about the need to contextualize research uh, within the localities of wherever that research is taking place so that uh, knowledge that is gained through that research can be directly applied in practice. Um, Mahendra, what are your thoughts on, on this subject matter in general? And what are the key barriers perhaps that you're facing and how you're turning those barriers and challenges into opportunities in the work that you do at the university? Emila, I hope you can hear me better now. Is yes. Better? Thank okay, you. thank you. So uh, I think depending on the level that we are, if you look across Africa and considering Mauritius as well, uh, if you wanted to start improving the built environment, I think we can we need to start very, very slowly. We can we can maybe start with energy, water, materials. That's my personal uh, viewpoint on that. Of course, green, green building is much more comprehensive and hands free. But if you want to get somewhere, I would recommend, like Simon mentioned, and also Kalim on the regulations. So if you can start regulating or at maybe at building a uh, permit application level itself, we need to have very basic control on the image performance of the buildings. And also in terms of water, because uh, we need to have sites manage their own water, so they would need to show how they are managing the runoff. And I would also recommend uh, in terms of materials, if we can start having on the market, government can start uh, enforcing that materials that we are using in building projects should have at least an environmental product declaration. So this type of of uh, regulations, I think, will really get us started. So I think we can start with energy, water, materials. At least we have is three fundamental uh, dimensions of green buildings, which are really impacting climate change. And then from there, we can move forward. Yeah. Thank you, Mahendra. It is actually really important that you're touching upon the need to set minimum standards through environmental regulations and others, which is something that Kelly mentioned as well, so that the, the mainstream could be elevated and lifted and accelerated towards the decarbonization of the sector. Um, I am mindful of the time, uh, and I know there is a great question from Tom uh, in the in the chat here, asking about how can we enhance collaboration. Perhaps uh, if I may turn to all of you to give us your closing remarks and perhaps one key action that you think could be implemented today to help build bridge the gap, the capacity and knowledge gap to help build collective capacity and upskilling across the built environment sector. And with the emphasis on, on, on mentioning the collaboration, that would be wonderful. Um, Kalim, may I perhaps start with you? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank Mena. you. Okay. Uh, well, I, you know, the, the scale of the uh, proportion of the uh, problem that we have with the scale of the population that you see in, in most of the Asian and African countries, uh, bridging the gap is something that needs to be taken in a very revolutionary manner. If we go by the past or practice now at a speed that we have like producing, you know, professionals in four year courses or five year courses in universities. And then that is something in four years, your population is going to jump like anything. And your, pop, your, your problems are going to jump or increase in the same proportion. So I, I would say that uh, we need to collaborate in the sense, how do we bridge the gap between the knowledge and have people trained, not three, four, five years down the line, but rather something like what we discussed last time with Simon that, you know, skills, we need to have certain skills, uh, you know, done in the sense that how, what sort of skills do we really need and in how much time we can train those people and then have them work. Like it's just an example of what I what must have known, like, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, in, in China, like, uh, what was it, footman, medical man or something like that? You know, when you had, in every village you had this, um, medical trained in a way which can solve uh, the, the immediate medical problems. Uh, on a similar pattern, I would say that we should have um, 
educational institutions uh, give certain selected skills to students and have them come into the field and do some work as, as, as skilled workers, skilled architects, and, and, or, or maybe uh, for urban areas, you need some, a combination of skills needed, just not, uh, you know, watertight compartments that, you know, got architects, planners, and so on. So th these are some of the things that I see. I really can't have a ready answer, but I think we need to, you know, jump, have a, a greater leap in the bridging the knowledge gap and be more practical of what is needed, not at the, at the speed or at the pace we are doing at the moment. Thank you, Karim. Fatma, may, may we hear also your closing remarks for today's session? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard question, but I think since we have we have knowledge and we already know what we are we we need to do uh, so maybe the answer is the climate framework it's a great initiative that we can we can work on it immediately between universities and academic institutions and the industry who are interested in enhancing their sustainability knowledge and um, it doesn't really take much time to do this so i think this initiative can be like the answer Thank you, Fatma. Uh, Mahendra, may, may we also have your closing remarks, please? Okay, uh, I think if we need to uplift the, uh, the, the building sector, of course, if we will train uh, the architects, the engineers, that's one side of it, but ultimately the decision makers would be the owners and the developers of the building. So I think one fundamental uh, perspective should be raising awareness and uh, native, uh, in the context of COP26, when we were carrying out campaigns, people were very concern about climate change. So I think if we reach out to the community and show them the impacts of climate change and how their buildings can make contribution, if they start demanding this type of solutions, then it's going to, to work, I think. So we need to also look at the raising awareness of the community and so that they are decision makers as investors in the future buildings. They would actually ask for this type of solution. I think this is accelerated the Thank you, Mahendra. Victoria, uh, if you, for me, um, it's a question of what happens before that demand comes, right? What happens before clients are asking for it? What happens before regulations come? What can the practicing architects across the CA do right now, today, right? The framework can be applied to um, the academic institutions with the new architects that are being trained for the profession, but also to those who perhaps need a bit of retraining, right? In terms of what buildings, how buildings need to be built today and how we need to adjust to a changing world. And so my kind of call to action would be to set targets on every single project that every single architect is working on. And that project can be completely wildly different in, uh, in terms of ambition. It could be as, as much as better carbon intensity for the project, better carbon budget for that project, evaluate every design decision against that, against that target question and challenge the supply chain and the practitioners about what else needs to happen in order to stick to that budget. Or it could be as simple as carry out an LCA, right? And think about um, and, and, and understand the impacts of, the, of uh, the decisions that are being made today, because that helps inform clients and they'll ask for that on the next project. And that's the power that these practitioners have in their hands today. And that's how they can learn. And so setting those targets is an absolute, um, is, is, a, is absolutely essential um for the outcomes but collaboration is, is, is absolutely essential to achieve those targets so it, it helps foster that collaboration that we have to see through the sector as well the every discipline involved in that in that project will be invested in what that outcome what that final number looks like and that's that's how we facilitate change thank you victoria simon yes i mean i think in terms of um, barriers, <clears throat> one of the ones that I would highlight, and this is, of course, a really broad generalization and not universally the case, but is uh, a sometimes a slight rigidness or inflexibility to the qualifications landscape, and that's sort of speaking as an education uh, provider. Um, but I think the flip side of that is that we've seen incredible, what we've seen incredibly clearly from students and early career practitioners is that a lot of them are desperate for this more holistic and integrated approach um, to their education and training and practice. And I think, you know, it's really 
in some ways, again, ending on a high, I think it's really actually impactful and empowering that there is this incredible demand for um, this and uh, that all we need to do, and it's not a small thing, is create a framework that can accommodate that demand. Um, and I think that's the big the big challenge that, that we need to set ourselves. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things I think is interested, final point related to this conversation is that this interest in young people and sort of more integrated approaches to learning extends not just sort of between disciplines, but I think it also from our experience really extends across geographies. Um, and so I think also we look to find a way, how do we build that into our education and training? Um, and I suppose on the collaboration front, I don't have a magic solution, but I think one of the things that we try to do, and I think possibly helps along this journey, uh, and again, overall, that one final sort of cliche is that what we're doing is we're not just teaching the next generation of practitioner, but we're actually teaching the next generation of tutor. And that is embedded within the sort of learning framework. And so that when people go out, they're keen to not just practice, but to pass on their skills and knowledge. And I do think from our experience and looking at our alumni and things that this creates uh, a sort of desire to form these collaborative networks um, in a way that is, is impactful. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. And I think to close the session, I heard, and I've, I've been rigorously writing down notes from all of you, um, a great insight on what kind of key actions we need to collectively take across the global buildings and construction sector, as well as academia to help bridge this capacity gap that currently exists at a critical uh, scale. And I heard that it needs to be revolu revolutionary that we can, to be able to deliver fast and at scale, we need to really need a revolution rather than evolution perhaps, or vice versa, however you wanna, wanna look at it. And that we need to contextualize our research. Fatma talked about the importance of uh, research uh, being not developed in silos, but in, in real, uh, sort of in it as a response to the real need in practice. And also the cross-disciplinary, both Victoria and, and Simon mentioned this, the need to uh, address cross-disciplinary, the, the subject matter from a cross-disciplinary perspective addressing all the stakeholders, inviting all the stakeholders to be a part of this journey because they are inevitably a part of the journey and defining specific outcomes and targets from day one in all of the projects to help bridge this gap. And so I'm, I'm very thankful uh, for all of you to be a part of today's session. And we hope that the Climate Framework Initiative actually does all of this and we welcome everyone to join because this is the only way we can help bring this global challenge into a local solutions that can be shared across the world. Of course, yes, more than welcome to. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Worms, and I'm a senior science policy advisor for a research organization called World Agroforestry. That means we deal with the non built environment, the real environment, the environment that provides your built environment with the feedstock you need to achieve your objectives. A large proportion of that feedstock is, as you know, comprised of extremely carbon intensive carbon and steel and there are moves afoot to change that by integrating more wood and more biomass into those feedstocks. The question that I um, ask myself, having listened to the presentations and the comments here is um, why you're not going upstream enough to understand how landscapes are impacted by that demand. I had an absolutely the scariest Halloween conversation I've ever had in my life was speaking to a man who is an absolute genius at raising funds and at convincing farmers of, of putting trees into their landscapes, something called agroforestry, which we study and which we advocate for. So I was a scary because this man was telling me that he could do no more than three tree, three tree species on the entire world in order to fit the needs of industry. Simplification of landscapes is what is putting carbon in the atmosphere, not just uh, uh, emissions. And simplifications of landscape is what is damaging biodiversity and with that sustainability and resilience. So I would like to encourage the people who are trying to develop a framework for the build environment to clean up its act, to keep in mind that the demand that they have and the risks of simplification that it has on landscapes might undo everything that they're doing downstream with the initiatives you've been discussing now. And so I, I conclude my remark with a question is, are you planning to involve the uh, various research organizations who are looking at landscape scale effects in order to ensure that that too is part of the whole analysis that you must do to clean up the built environment framework? Thank you.
I'm so thankful you mentioned this because it's so critical that we actually need to, not only within the sector, across different professions, and we currently do not, we work in silos, but let alone not only within the sector, but beyond the sector, we need to be so that we can ensure that whatever knowledge and skills that we're gaining for the sector to help deliver a decarbonized through the environment sector, uh, we, we don't create any unintended consequences in other parts of the world. So I'm very thankful for you having brought this up, and it is definitely our core focus and mission to help uh, engage and collaborate with others beyond our sector so we can deliver effective solutions that are resilient. Thank you. Any other comments uh, if anyone wanted to share? Frank Wilker with the International Code Council and really appreciate the conversation around the importance of building codes and, and regulations and sort of setting that floor and allowing folks to uh, you know, proceed even further. I guess the question for the group is, um, you know, as you talk about education for building professionals, how can we advance the advocacy side of being able to engage clients in that conversation, to engage state, uh, federal, uh, national, local governments in that conversation, um, and ensure that they have the tools to be able to effectively advocate for, for what we need to help move things forward? Thank you so much for that question. I don't know if anyone from our panel would like to comment on that, but I, if I may just briefly mention that advocacy is really important. And advocacy requires also a certain level of knowledge to be able to advocate for, for something. And therefore the, the focus on the Climate Framework Initiative, even though we talked about it being a very much focused initiative for the built environment sector for the time being to help practitioners and, um, and those practicing as well as studying in, in universities to build this holistic knowledge base. It is also very much all the touching upon the built environment actors. And I call them actors because there are policymakers, there are clients, there are the developers who are not necessarily designing or delivering those buildings, but who are part of the key decision making process and who need to be collectively with all of us as practitioners of the industry, the advocates for the same mission and ambition. And I think my immediate response is that we would we would be encouraging them to also engage with the initiative to help bring that conversation and advocacy from their perspectives to, to our sort of world where we may be working silos a little bit um, so that we can really scale our impact collectively. I don't know if anyone from our panel would like to add more. I guess, I guess just to say that um, that's a, a really uh, strong role of the Green Building Council movement as well from a national level, but also regional and globally. Um, Green Building Council respond to uh, policy consultations, they publish manifestos, they say, you know, this is the type of code we need to see to draw this very global issue into a very localized um, set of codes. Um, there are whole life carbon roadmaps being developed by different green building councils in different markets in order to inform policies. So advocacy, advocacy is a really strong part of that role, informed by the knowledge of the sector in terms of the delivery. You know, there's, there's policy out there currently serving as a barrier to our goals, right? There's limits to how much on-site renewable energy you can generate, there's limits to, you know, you sort of drive people down a different route into, that might be in, in conflict or out of sync with a, an optimal performance solution. So um, it's really that on the ground knowledge that helps support those advocacy calls for action and it's something that Green Building Councils around the world do. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining our conversation today. Thank you, our panelists joining us virtually from all around the world. Uh, we're very thankful for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Thank you very much.